All right, looks like everyone is coming into the room. Welcome, welcome. Um, hi everyone, my name is Allison Hurrier and um, I head up the textile arts program at Portland State University in the School of Art and Design. Thank you so much today for joining us for the final event in our open classroom series for the spring 2021 term. For those of you uh, joining us from outside the university, the textile arts curriculum is an elective track in the BFA art practice program that provides an interdisciplinary approach to the study of clothing and textiles. We offer courses in weaving, surface design, sewn construction, and dress history that encourage students to develop portfolios for a variety of applications in apparel, costume, textiles, and contemporary art. We will be restarting this open classroom series again in fall term, just in time for Portland Textile Month. We encourage you to visit our website, which I've linked in the chat, um, if you would like to stay up to date on our events and course offerings. Also, feel free to tell us uh, who you are and where you're beaming in from today, because it's always fun to know who is on the other side of the screen. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are joining you all from Portland State University, which is located near the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous people whose tra traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of Chinook, Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Today, we are so thrilled to welcome Max Adrian. Max Adrian is a visual artist whose soft sculptural work playfully considers queer ideas of desire, identity, and consumerism. He recently completed his MFA in Fiber and Material Studies from Temple University's Tyler School of Art and Architecture in Philadelphia. He received a BFA in Fiber and Creative Writing from the Kansas City Art Institute in 2015. Adrian's practice has been supported by several arts organizations, including the Center for Craft, the Foundation for Contemporary Arts, and the Greater Columbus, Columbia, the Greater Columbus Arts Council. Sorry, uh, he has uh, participated in a variety of residency programs, including the Vermont Studio Center, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts, Lighthouse Works, and Malay Colony for the Arts. He is currently based in Columbus, Ohio. Today, we will get a peek into Max's practice and his insights for navigating the world of contemporary art. We will have a designated Q&A session following the talk, but please feel free to type uh, questions and comments into the chat as we go. Max, thank you so much for being here with us today. I am so excited for I'm you. I'm so uh, excited to be here and for to on share. On a personal note, <laughs> I, I mean, students who've been in my class, they know that I share your work all the time. So this is really thrilling for us to have you with us. Um, I will let you take it from here. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Allison. Okay, let's see. Let's get the screen share going. Uh, actually. Just one little technical difficulty. Okay, now we should be set. Okay, sorry about that, y'all. Um, all right, so my name is Max. Uh, I am a queer visual artist, primarily working in sewing and soft sculpture. Um, and I'm so excited to be sharing this virtual space with you all today. Um, when, I, when I do these kinds of uh, visiting artist talks with undergrad classes, um, I really like to use this opportunity to be as much, uh, as much of a resource for you all as I can possibly be. So in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna share a lot of information with you. Uh, I'll share a bit about my trajectory since 
leaving undergrad six years ago now, which is really weird to think about. So I'll talk a bit about the development of my work in that time, um, as well as some of the people and places who have been a part of that development. And along the way of this talk, I'll share some really concrete resources uh, with you all to give you an idea of some of the opportunities that are out there for you all when you leave school. So this will really be kind of a combination of artist talk with uh, professional practice tips kind of scattered throughout. So starting here with my um, first image, this is a bit of a teaser of what's to come. This is uh, an image of my most recent work that I just finished last month um, and will eventually come full circle. And I'll talk about this at the, at the very end of the talk, but just to give you an idea of what's to come. Um, before that, I'll, I'll rewind a bit, um, going back to my, my time in undergrad. So I, I got my BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute in fiber and creative writing in 2015 but I originally went to undergrad for animation. Uh, I, I only lasted about five weeks in that program before I realized that I just didn't have the, the skill set for it and it just wasn't a good fit for me. And I transferred into an extremely different department, uh, the fiber department, but took with me a lot of the same interests that I had in the animation department. So I had the strong interest in personifying objects and developing this sense of character, the sense of narrative between objects, and just having this overall sense of playfulness with my work. So all of those, all of those things that initially took me into animation persisted into uh, the soft sculpture kinds of installations and things I was doing um, in my undergrad. Um, from there, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit to uh, uh, one year after graduation in the summer of 2016, where uh, I moved from Kansas City to Columbus, Ohio, uh, where my boyfriend had moved for his job. So I was getting kind of settled in a, in a new city and, and learning what, what arts opportunities were out there. And I also uh, needed to find a job. So uh, the kind of weird job that I landed on, um, I found a sewing job at a commercial mascot costume company in downtown Columbus, where we made these inflatable mascot costumes like Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, this is a red panda costume that we made for the Columbus Zoo. So this was a really, honestly, just totally bizarre, crazy fit for a job for me at that time because I had already been um, experimenting with sewn inflatables in my studio and then came across this and got hired on the spot. Um, to be completely honest with you, this was not a great job. Um, it, it did not pay very well at all. Um, and the work environment there was also not um, ideal. But the, the um, costume shop was very flexible with my hours. So I was able to develop a schedule kind of on my own terms to some degree. Um, and I learned so many new sewing skills during my uh, year, year and a half or so that I was with them, uh, as well as I did so much dumpster diving for free materials at the end of every shift. And honestly, this is material that I'm still kind of working through today. So it wasn't great, but it had its perks and it definitely influenced the direction of my work. Um, so here's a, an example of um, some of those experiments in the studio while I was working at the costume shop. This is the first uh, inflatable piece that I, that I made with the materials from my job, primarily faux fur with some uh, imitation leather and some spandex and some other things as well. Um, but yeah, this was just me kind of like applying the, the skills and techniques from the day job into some of my own personal interests. Um, but during this time, I was also investing a lot of time into refining my professional practices. So I'm gonna share a little bit about that real quick. Um, so these were some of the, these four websites at the top were the main kind of resources I was looking at for uh, open calls, whether they were exhibitions or residencies or publications, different kinds of things. I just sort of got in the habit of looking at these once or twice a week and, and just really keeping tabs on what opportunities were out there. Um, it does, uh, I've kind of been out of the habit of, of looking at these in the last couple of years of grad school, but it, it does kind of look like this landscape is, is changing a little bit. And so many of these open calls are 
kind of moving to um, to things like Instagram. So it's it's definitely a, a changing landscape in terms of open calls. Um, but I highly encourage you to take a look at these websites and to keep tabs on some galleries or nonprofit organizations that you're interested in um, on social media, because that's where a lot of the action is happening these days. Um, and really, really, really get to know your local arts organizations. So you probably know a whole lot more about these, uh, these two examples than I do. I just did a quick Google search around, um, around Portland, but the Regional Arts and Culture Council and the Oregon Arts Commission seem to offer lots of great opportunities. Um, and, and yeah, just in general, local arts organizations are, are usually really great for getting some money for materials or getting um, a local arts residency or all kinds of things. So um, get to know those places. Uh, and during, during that time working at the costume shop, I, I just really spent a lot of time into refining my um, documentation skills and my writing skills. So these are the, the sort of basic app, uh, application materials that go into pretty much anything, whether it's for an exhibition or a residency or for grad school, you're definitely gonna need images with really good lighting and some good detail shots. You're gonna need a concise narrative of your accomplishments in an artist bio, as well as a concise narrative of your, the content of your work in an artist statement. Um, and then of course, CV, kind of standard resume stuff. Um, so that's all just really, really standard stuff that once you kind of get this package developed, you can plug it into lots of different opportunities and tweak them for individual applications. Uh, this is an example of how I kept myself organized during that time. So I would have a folder for every opportunity. And then within that folder, I'd have all of the materials. So all of the images I submitted in the order that I submitted them in, uh, as well as all of the, the writing that I did, either the general writing or the more specific writing for the opportunity. And then I color coded it. Um, green means I got it. Red means uh, I was rejected and yellow was pending. So it was kind of a, a good system of just keeping tabs on everything that I was uh, applying to. And I would regularly have this rolling uh, calendar of deadlines on my desktop that I'd regularly look at and add to and check off my list. Um, so this was just a good way to keep me uh, organized in terms of the things that were coming up. So that's just my system. There are so many different ways to keep yourself organized, but yeah, just a little glimpse at the way that I've, that I've done it in the past. Um, in this talk, I'll talk about three of the different residencies that I applied to during this time um, and go into a little bit more information about, about them, starting with, uh, the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, Vermont. Um, so I went to the Vermont Studio Center. I had been working at the costume shop for maybe six or seven months. And then I took a month off of work to come to the Vermont Studio Center, which is a great, great place up in a small town, Johnson, which is super just gorgeous. Um, one month residency for artists and writers. Uh, and they provide, in the fellowship, they provide all of the room and, and studio and meals, all those fees. Um, and the fellowship isn't exactly rare. I, I wanna say that it's something like 15% of people who come to the Vermont Studio Center have a fellowship that covers all of those expenses, um, which is really great. That's a really high percentage for a fully funded uh, residency. So um, they have rolling, uh, they have deadlines three times a year for that fellowship. Um, so another really great opportunity to keep on your uh, radar for uh, an emerging artist kind of residency. Um, during my month at the Vermont Studio Center, I started to develop some new work that was largely influenced by um, my time at the costume shop. Um, so in that, in that costume gig where I was making these high profile commercial characters, in my own studio practice, I started to envision what a queer mascot could look like that wasn't motivated by uh, capitalism. Um, so this is the, the kind of starting point of that. And it also gives you a little bit of a idea of my technical process where I start with the nylon ripstop lining to, to get the form of the inflatable down. And then after I uh, get that locked in, I move on to the exterior layer, whether it's spandex or faux fur or whatever the, the outer layer is. Um, so there's a, always this kind of internal and exterior uh, uh, structure to the piece. 
Um, some other influences at the time that were going into that work, um, drag as an art form has always been a huge influence for me. Um, and in particular, drag as a form of street performance or activism. So the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence in San Francisco were, uh, I was looking at their work a lot during that time. Um, I was watching a lot of John Waters films and uh, just love the drag queen divine. Um, just love how irreverent she is and crass and crude and funny. And she just has no, absolutely no respect for the dominant ideals of society. Um, some other uh, visual artists I was looking at at the time, of course, Klaus Oldenburg with any soft sculpture. He's, he's in the conversation to some degree uh, with this idea of kind of soft, floppy uh, art that defies the super macho standards of sculpture. Um, but also artists like Wells, uh, queer artists like Wells Chandler, whose um, crochet works uh, play with gender expression and identity, but also really poke at this idea of art being this really serious thing. Um, what I love so much about Wells Chandler is his kind of insistence on joy and, and particularly queer joy. Um, and I just love, love that so much and, and aspire to that in my own work. Um, one last influence, uh, Bread and Puppet Theater, these massive uh, puppets that they would do in these, these big productions, sometimes in the streets of New York City, but um, often in their, uh, where they're located in rural Vermont, actually very close to the Vermont Studio Center. Um, so you can visit their barn uh, up in rural Vermont. That's just this massive old barn that's kind of falling apart and is just full of puppets from the last several decades of their really amazing work. Um, so all of these things that I'm, I'm talking about really kind of came together into this new work that I was, this new series that I, I called the Sensational Inflatable Furry Divines. So each of these furry divines kind of becomes this abstract mascot character that embodies different ideas about play or touch or general feelings about bodies and awkwardness. Um, so this is the install shot from a couple months after the Vermont Studio Center and my first uh, solo show at the Roy G. Biff Gallery in Columbus. Um, to give you a little better sense of, of scale and seeing them in relation to each other. Um, this space is, is another space that I encourage you to kind of keep tabs on. Even though they're in Columbus, they do really great work for emerging artists, both nationally and internationally. Um, they do really, really great uh, programming and exhibitions. So take a look at them as well. Um, shortly after that, that solo show, I moved to uh, Tennessee, to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, for a year-long residency at the... Um, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. This, this is an incredible place. I, I just can't speak highly enough about Aramont. Um, there, there are so many different ways to engage with Aramont. Uh, during the summer and fall, they offer a national, it's their national workshop season. So every week they have a different group of, um, uh, of I wanna say like six or seven, maybe even more workshops at a time and all kinds of different techniques from wood turning to wheel throwing to screen printing um, to all, all kinds of stuff. Um, so you can take a workshop there, you can be uh, a work study there and you can do the residency there. They have this year long opportunity for emerging craft artists um, where you have lots of time to just to develop your work in the studio um, but you also get some really great professional development experience, whether it's teaching workshops or um, doing uh, 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 gallery work, because all of the residents install and deinstall all of the exhibitions on campus and the, the three or four different galleries around campus. Um, so overall, it's just a, a really incredible experience um, being a couple years out of school. Um, this is a, a shot of our studios um, toward the back of campus, tucked into the woods. This was my favorite studio, honestly. It was just so amazing to be so surrounded by green trees. It was incredible. Um, little glimpse into my studio at the time. 
You can see on the right, uh, I was developing another furry divine that was based on all of the black bears that were just running around Gatlinburg. Um, but I was also developing some new work during that time. Uh, so this is uh, the start of a new series called The Buddies, um, where I was adapting an old 1970s sewing pattern for like a, a, a stuffed animal cat, um, where I turned it into the sewing pattern for a kind of ambiguous gimp suit sort of figure. Um, I was thinking a lot about queer community at this time. Um, as much as I love Aramont and really encourage everyone to look into it, I often found myself as one of, if not the only queer person in a lot of circles there. So I was just spending a lot of time thinking about my role as a queer person within a greater queer community. Uh, so these buddies, which are each about uh, 18 inches tall, um, really blur lines of stuffed animal or pet or person or if they're in costume or in their natural skins. Um, and they eventually grew into this much larger ongoing piece, the buddy community, that I installed several times over a few years and always differently uh, as the, the dynamics between these buddies was continuing to shift and evolve. Uh, Toward the end of that residency, I made uh, the another furry divine. This is Corona, which is a very weird coincidental title. <laughs> um, Corona, the furry divine of insatiable appetites. Um, and this is one of the first times that I was starting to think super directly about uh, what it means to exist in a constant state of consumption. Um, and that idea of, of uh, being a consumer um, has just become more and more relevant to my, my more recent work. Um, here's a little install shot of our final exhibition at the end of that residency. Another great kind of professional experience to go through of installing this entire exhibition. This is one of three rooms that we installed in where we did everything for the show from sanding the walls to, to writing the wall text and installing the wall text to doing the lighting. Like we went through everything um, every step of the way with the gallery director. Um, and this will be the last residency that I'll share some information with you about, um, Lighthouse Works. Uh, I did this residency uh, the fall after I left uh, Aramont. This is a, a shorter residency. It's six weeks on a small island, technically New York State, but off of the coast of Connecticut. It's actually only accessible from a ferry from Connecticut. Um, and just a really, really cool place. They provide, you know, they cover all expenses and there's a really nice stipend um, as well as some programming with the local island community. Um, this was my view just outside of the studio during that six weeks. It was just incredible that I could just walk out of my studio door in 20 feet, this was the view. Um, during that six weeks, I, I went to, to Lighthouse Works really wanting to experiment and to break out of some of the series-based work that I was getting really comfortable in. So I, um, I packed up a very limited uh, amount of materials for myself and, and shipped it away. And then I only had um, those materials to work from and kind of established different stations around my studio and alternated between them um, to try out some new ideas. But a lot of those ideas were coming back to um, considering my relationship to quilting a little bit more directly as someone who's sewing with uh, like, I mean, with every artwork, it has some, some aspect of sewing in it. So I was trying to think for myself uh, about my relationship to quilting and the idea of quilts as a source of comfort, as, as a storytelling device, as an emblem of identity. So all of those kind of relations to quilting and how they uh, relate to queer comfort. And then, uh, yeah, so here's an install shot from our open studio event at the end of the residency to give you an idea of some of the stuff that came from that time. Um, after I left that residency, I returned to Columbus and had to find a new job. And the new job uh, that I found was this place at, called Otherworld, um, which is a immersive art, uh, experience kind of place very similar to Meow Wolf if you're familiar with them. Um, I was one of uh, the two original textile people on the team 
And we did all kinds of really crazy textile projects from uh, full room installations to um, different inflatable components within certain rooms it was just, I mean, we were doing all kinds of really crazy things. Um, this gig was very different from the costume gig in that um, it actually paid really well. Um, it was it was a lovely surprise to see that I could find a job like doing art things and make more than eleven dollars an hour. Um, so this this paid really well, but it was super it was a super hectic work environment and completely draining artistically. Um, I had a lot of fun at this job and was you know I mean able to participate and collaborate in some really amazing things but I had no energy for my own studio practice during the seven months that I was working here. Um, I, I hardly made any work in my own studio during that entire time. Um, pretty much the only, the only thing that I did make and or did do for myself was apply to grad school. Uh, I, I applied to five different programs um, before eventually landing on um, Tyler in Philadelphia. Um, which I will get to um, in just a little bit. Um, yeah, so that's my my other world experience. Um, I left I left other world um, at the end of the spring before I started grad school. So I kind of had an open summer to get ready to move and to I had a solo show that summer that I was preparing for. So during that summer, I made the the final furry divine. Um, this is Sabina, the furry divine of violent revelations. Um, and with Sabina, I was, I was just sitting with a lot of different thoughts about violence. Um, the, the starting point for the piece was really trying to reconcile my, my personal love of the horror genre. I love horror movies um, and play a lot of like scary video games. So trying to reconcile my, my love for horror with the very real despair and outrage that I feel at violence inflicted on um, queer and other marginalized people. Um, so that was really the starting point for, for this piece, but expanded into all kinds of different ideas of violence from um, the violence of whiteness to um, misogyny and trans misogyny within queer communities. Um, so with, with Sabina, I'm, I'm really like reconciling with a, a lot here. Um, but ultimately wanted to kind of embody, like have this figure embody um, an, an ambiguous form of violence. So it's really about this kind of graphic contrast between the inconspicuous low uh, pile white fur and then the super raw graphic uh, visceral kind of glittery red interior that simultaneously suggests like a, a slashing or a bleeding through or a, a wound or a portal. So um, yeah, many different uh, formal reads. Um, and this is uh, an installation image from that solo show at the, at, uh, the end of that summer, right before I started grad school um, at the Yeiser Art Center in Paducah, Kentucky, um, uh, which was really cool to see all five of the pieces in the same space um, for the first time ever. I had only ever installed um, two of them together uh, at one time. So um, yeah, it was really neat to see them in one space and, and they're on, um, each one is on its own timer schedule. So they inflate and deflate at different times and occasionally sync up to where they all kind of inflate or deflate um, uh, in union, but sometimes they're, they're just kind of doing their own thing. So it's interesting to see the kind of conversation between the bodies start to happen within the space. Um, so that is, my work leading up to grad school. And then it's this question of how do I talk about grad school? <laughs> because it's, it's, let me tell you, it's been a lot. Um, grad school, I think is in, inherently, intentionally a, a destabilizing experience. And then, you know, throw on a pandemic and lots of political upheaval and turmoil. And yeah, it's been, it's been a weird time as I'm sure you can all relate as well being in school yourselves. So um, rather than uh, try to talk about the journey right now as I'm still kind of processing it, um, I'm just gonna share some 
images about my thesis show from last month and kind of go into some detail about the, the projects that I'm leaving grad school with. Um, so my work is, is very much in a, a state of transformation right now. Um, and it's hard to really have a, a full sense of perspective in the midst of it. Um, but the one kind of simple way that I've characterized it for myself um, for the time being is that the work I was making before school was so based in um, personal ideas and relationships to identity and desire. And with this new work, I'm, I'm not trying to leave identity behind, but, but rather I'm trying to kind of zoom outward from a place of identity politics and to consider the systems of desire and consumerism um, that surround um, personal identities and these systems that we're all participating in, um, and particularly how uh, desire is mediated through technology. So the new kind of uh, uh, lexicon or, or new um, series of, of things that are informing um, the new reference points for this work are things like social media usage, um, data surveillance and artificial intelligence, um, online shopping and video games. That's kind of where I'm, I'm uh, spending a lot of time in research and kind of pulling new um, ideas and words and forming um, my new vocabulary around this work. Um, with this piece, the self-pissing consumption unit, um, this is me maybe being the most kind of silly and direct with these ideas. Um, so the yellow furry objects that you see in this piece were some of the first things that I made uh, in my first semester of grad school as I was trying to um, branch out into more architectural ideas. Um, I had a very, a very specific uh, vision for these yellow pieces that would, that would stack into this yellow furry tower and it ended up just being kind of stupid. And um, I wanted to reconsider these objects um, rather than as like pieces that have a very specific um, isolated purpose, I wanted to think of them in a more expansive way as mutable kind of building blocks that could be, or tools that could be used in different ways. So I started to use them as miniature sets, recording different videos happening inside of them. Um, and I started to combine them with different materials, um, eventually, uh, combining them with lots of waste materials and fluids, showing residues on the objects and implying these kinds of absurd systems um, that, they're, that they're a part of. Um, so ultimately what I'm doing here is, is considering the simultaneous feelings of shame and comfort that I feel as a consumer um, while taking stock of my, my personal habits and patterns of consumption. So I'm doing that by, by this attempt at blurring person and body and architecture and machine um, as a way to, to consider how bodies are implicated in these greater systems within our, our built environments. Uh, and this is just a little detail inside one of those yellow furry spaces on an old um, iPhone. I have a, a loop of videos playing um, that I recorded with these objects of like a hand kind of reaching up through a hole or a plug being removed out of um, one of the, the spaces or like a pom-pom being lowered into it. So really trying to complicate this idea of symptoms, uh, of systems and, and how bodies are coming into contact with these objects. Uh, the next big piece, uh, Threshold for the Cyber Citizen. I started this piece right as school was shut down in March, 2020. And this became my primary quarantine project from that time through the summer into the next fall. Um, so this is a seven foot by seven foot by five inch deep um, projection screen that is sewn with lots of teeny tiny three inch um, pieces of nylon ripstop that come into this kind of game board looking uh, uh, object. Um, so with this piece was thinking a lot about how bodies are coming into contact with screens as we can all relate to these days. Um, but especially in those early COVID times where, um, you know, we were all binging um, Tiger King and all kinds of crazy stupid things for sources of comfort um, and Zooming in school um, 
most days and zooming with family all the time and just we were doing so much interfacing with with our screens and for me i was playing a lot of uh video games in my spare time to kind of uh for for my sense of comfort at that time particularly with animal crossing which you know is, is super just calm and meditative and orderly um which was a much needed feeling in those uh early days of chaos so I'm thinking a lot about how our virtual spaces that we inhabit can kind of serve as this expansion to our lived environments um, and the sort of blurring that's happening of, of our physical and virtual spheres that are becoming increasingly more, um, that are looking increasingly more like each other. Um, so this object exists uh, in a similar way to the, the shelving unit. I wanted to think about this projection screen as something that can exist in lots of different ways. So. Um, in this kind of uh, daytime mode with the projection screen turned off, there's a, a television behind with this video on a loop of my hand reaching through, kind of beckoning you toward the, the game board center. Um, but in its nighttime mode, when it becomes an actual projection screen, uh, it's being projected from the backside. Um, and these projections uh, I'm, I'm making come from uh, video gameplay and social media usage or tours of virtual models in um, 3D modeling software. Um, so it's very lo-fi kinds of stuff. It's, it's not really about um, a video as much as it is this play of movement and color being filtering, uh, filtered through the object. Um, yeah, so this ultimate play of comfort and hypnosis um, extension and expansion. And then finally coming full circle back to my, uh, my first image. This is the, the last piece I'll talk about, a fallible complex. And this was pretty much the only thing that I worked on in my entire, this entire last semester of school. Um, uh, this is the largest piece that I've ever made. Um, it's a large architectural inflatable that the viewer actually activates themselves. So you as the viewer reach into this kind of central hole here and flip a switch on the blower that activates it from the kind of puddle on a fabric on the floor to a 12 foot wide by eight foot tall bounce house looking structure. And so the idea here is that it's a very alluring structure that invites you in, but presents no clear mode of entry or deeper access. So um, there's this doorway kind of carved out for you, but there's nowhere, it, there's nowhere to go from there. It kind of prevents further access. So from that point, you can only really inhabit it mentally. Um, so thinking a lot about the, the virtual spaces that are imbued with meaning and significance. Um, uh, and at the same time that I'm thinking about these kind of virtual spaces, I'm also thinking about the, the real built environments that we engage with every day. And, and this idea of desiring uh, institutions and structures to become soft or malleable um, and really really thinking about this idea of impending collapse like this this structure is going to fall at some point and I'm just kind of thinking about what other institutions just and structures need to collapse these days um, so here's a, a detail of peering inside um, there's this real play between the super vibrant um, interior and the kind of milky translucent exterior. Um, and that that's everything I've got to share with you all today. Um, thank you so much for, for your time and attention. Um, and there's all of my, my contact info, please feel free to connect or reach out. Um, I'm of course happy to answer any and all questions today, but even after today, if you have any questions about grad school or residencies or uh, inflatables, you know, like whatever. I'm, I'm so happy to continue to be a resource for you all um, long after today. So yeah, thanks y'all. Max, thank you. That was so great. Um, it's just, I feel like whenever I think about you and your work and just, um, I, I I think about how how young you are and how much you have accomplished. <laughs> and I think it's it's so inspiring, I feel like, particularly for folks who are an undergraduate to kind of understand sort of what like 
what it could be to sort of what it is to be an early career artist, how you sort of start to cobble together these different sorts of experiences and make sense of these experiences and ways that they support your sort of larger sort of artistic goals or life goals and whatnot. Um, and then, yeah, and you're just, you've always just been creating like so much incredible work. Um, I w am gonna encourage everybody to just, if you want to um, just to type questions into the chat, if you'd like to ask um, anything of Max or um, um, would like something to be sort of repeated. Um, if you'd prefer to uh, ask your question verbally, um, if you just wanna type your name into the chat or use the raised hand function uh, and we will call on you, so. Um, but yeah, just to get us started, I mean, just in, in terms of thinking about that kind of um, that career trajectory, I, I'm just kind of moving from like the list of questions that I was writing down as you were talking here. Um, so just starting from the beginning, I think um, something I'm really interested in, it's like, so you talk about that job in the costume shop and like how it wasn't the best job, but like it had these certain benefits and then you did other things and then you went back to sort of the um, more kind of well-paying corporate sort of um, environmental sort of construction work. Um, I'm curious, like, at what point do you feel like, like, were you, what is, what is that point where you had that recognition where it's like, it's like, it's now time to move on. And, um, and how do you kind of prepare for that as an early career artist? Um, move on, like, uh, um, advancing from one opportunity to a, a kind of next level opportunity. Yeah, because I feel like that's, I, I think that that's like super crucial, right, for thinking about like um, how you spend your time in those early years and like what you're going to, like how you're going to move forward with your work, right? Yeah, um, I think so, so much of, of it in the beginning for me was just trying to be as, as curious and open minded as possible and to just like cast so many different lures. Um, uh, yeah, and I mean, I, I never would have thought that an inflatable mascot costume job would have been something that I would do, you know, um, but just really being kind of endless in my pursuit of seeing what things are out there um, led to some really surprising things. Um, and I think as, as artists, we can really <laughs> develop very unique uh, skill sets that can can seem to be very hard to apply to like real world practical jobs. Um, but things are out there, like they really are. And, and um, not to say that it's, it's easy by any means, but a big part of it is to just be constant in um, being alert and, and looking for opportunities. Um, I, I will say that so much for me felt like really good timing and luck. I mean, the, the other world thing, they, they were a, a, a very initially small startup that happened just like they were getting started at the same time that I was looking for a new job. And I just happened to look on Craigslist a couple hours after they posted their initial ad, um, which I know is, is maybe not like a, a very relieving thing to hear, um, but it, it's just kind of part of it is that um, by by constantly like looking for things, um, you keep yourself receptive. Um, I will say that that I I, I don't know that I, I see myself or my trajectory as like a, a complete like linear kind of upward kind of thing. Um, I mean, I'm I just left grad school, and the idea of like what do I do now can be like a pretty existential thing, <laughs> you know. Um, and there's a part of me that thinks like, I might have to go back to that costume job for a little bit, you know, even though it, it's not ideal, there, there might be times where um, you have to kind of circle back and, and there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I don't think that there's anything bad about um, revisiting things from um, past opportunities or whatever. It's, you know, we, we as artists have to do what we have to do to survive and make a living for ourselves. And sometimes that means um, temporarily doing something that's not ideal. Um, yeah, it sucks, but it's just the, the truth that I've, I've come to see. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, but I think one thing I think that you've done re like really well is to, t is to try to like think about like um, how your skill sets just engage with um, 
uh, what you can offer in that in that sort of world and and what you can get from that as well too so it's like like uh, trying to figure mm -hmm. out like the flexibility aspect of it or the you know um uh the the dump like the dumpster diving aspect of yeah. it. <laughs> like yeah. it's like what can i get from this thing um perhaps because yeah to a certain extent there's always like um especially when you're sort of first getting started that jobby job aspect of it is always kind of coming into play for sure yeah um, i think that's a really important point that you're bringing up like always thinking about like how can i find opportunities to support my practice um uh, even when I'm not like directly focused on my practice. Um, yeah, For it's sure. really important. Um, cool, I'm sure we'll get some questions here in a few, but um, I'll just continue on with mine. <laughs> oh wait, we got one, yay, Maria. Uh, given that your work is centered around difficult topics, how do you work through the emotions that come from creating these pieces? That's real. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, for, for me, um, so much of it is, it starts from a very personal place where, you know, I'm, I'm sitting with, with these, um, these ideas and feelings. Um, and my process is so uh, time intensive that I, I have a lot of time to think about them and to sit with them. Um, and that's, that's a really important thing for me is to have that kind of initial time. But it's always, it's, there's always this, um, ultimate goal that this object I'm making um, and, and spending a lot of time kind of processing and thinking through things will then go into a community and be and hopefully encourage a uh, conversation with other people. Um, so a, a strategy that I use um, to do that um, is to be very uh, earnest and kind of playful both in my um the way that i'm talking about my work um and the i mean even just like the form the formal kind of aspects of the work um being kind of play can can be a great way to open a door into a, a much um a deeper conversation um so that's that's what i've come to learn um is that um by being very just sincere and playful, I can kind of invite people into um, conversations that otherwise might might not happen. Um, Jordan is asking, just looking back, how critical was the time off you took from grad school? Do you think you would have been working in the same way if you hadn't spent the time in between your bachelor's and master's? Yeah, another great question. Um, I. I am so glad that I took the time in between um, undergrad and grad school. Um, and I, I regularly hear that from other folks who um, both who did take time off in between as well as, as some folks who didn't, who, who went straight from undergrad to grad school. I think that, um, I think that uh, there's something to be said about taking a break from existing within an institution um, and to develop your, even just like your own routine, like how you go into the studio and make work when um, there aren't dozens of other people surrounding, surrounding you and, and professors who are giving you deadlines, like having that time to just like kind of motivate yourself and give yourself deadlines and give yourself goals is, is a really important thing to learn. And, and I think for some people who go straight from undergrad to grad school, um, it's more of a shock when they eventually leave their master's program um, coming out of, I mean, potentially six years of being in higher education, not to mention coming going into undergrad straight from high school in a lot of cases. So having that break from an institution is so, is so critical. And I'm like, I'm even right now, I'm just like so excited to be out of an institution for the foreseeable future and, and to just kind of get my bearings um, on my own. Um, but with that said, I mean, everybody's different and there are no rules or, or anything, you know? I mean, there are plenty of people who, who go straight from undergrad to grad school and um, are very successful with that. So um, yeah, it was very helpful for me, but doesn't necessarily have to be helpful for everybody. Um, looking at some of the other questions. You mentioned, oh, yeah. Go ahead. 
When you mention a hopeful conversation brought up from the work, do you consider the conversation an artwork or is it just a subculture of the work? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the conversation is, is always uh, uh, a part of the motivation behind the work for me. It, it tends to start from a very personal place, but um, it's always with this the ultimate goal of, of the conversation happening as a result. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I, like, I am a maker through and through, and I think I would be making things even if nobody saw them. Um, so yeah, that's just my, my own, my own thing. Um, but yeah, having conversations around art and with art, um, with other people, with art in a space is so, I'm just like, during these, this last year of virtual school, I'm, I'm really appreciating those in-person conversations with art in a space. It's so, it, it's so amazing. Um, the things that can come up in those conversations. Um, so yeah, it's very important for me. Joey's also asking um, why textiles and 3D forms, what encouraged the addition of lights and things like phones and other tech? Yeah, um, why textiles? Um, yeah, it's a good a good question. Um, to the the like honest answer, going back to my undergrad days, is that I chased a boy into the fiber department, <laughs> um, and then once I was in the department and was in Allison's sewing class, I just really connected to sewing um, as a as sewing as a form of um, uh, of sculpture. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And having done it for, for almost a decade now of, of using, of, of sewing and using textiles, it's, I, I've come to appreciate so many different things about them. Um, I, I, I love the associations with the body. Um, it's so, that is like always really, even though I'm not a garment maker or making costumes or anything, the, the associations to, everything from the clothes we wear to a drag costume to, um, uh, I don't know, the other textiles that we're constantly engaging with on a, on a regular basis is a, a great way, I think, to talk about these really kind of intimate ideas about bodies. Um, so yeah, there's this real kind of intimacy to textiles that translates, I think, regardless of how those textiles are being used. Um, I'm curious, so, can I just bounce off of that for a second? Yeah, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I am curious, like, have you found, I don't know if this is the case, but um, that just like the tactility of textiles and, and sort of the familiarity some people have with those processes or the fact that we engage with these things every day, does that create an accessibility around some of the conversations that you're having like in your work or? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I think so. Um, I that that is honestly the the tactility and in, in working with my hands is is the thing that made me go from um that made me leave animation and seek a different department because um as much as i love animation i needed to be doing this you know i needed to use my hands with a material to do something um so the the tactility the the hands-on um kind of components are um, so important for me and relate to like a long history of um, craft communities who are doing things, who are making things as a community together. Um, so all of those, those associations with, um, with making and, and craft and community are um, always in the back of my mind. Um, yeah, and just kind of subconscious and, and how I'm approaching materials and things. I love just really tactile materials. Uh, and I think that goes into um, one of the last uh, other questions um, about the difficult conversations, like having, um, being very playful and having very like tactile materials that people are immediately drawn to and want to engage with, even if they don't know how, like you put a furry object in a room and everybody wants to touch it. It's just, it's just what happens when there's faux fur in the room. Um, so it can be a great introduction um, to a, a more expansive experience. I wanted to ask a question, just thinking about 
my like fabric and form class and um, translating between 2D and 3D and creating these like patterns to make repeated forms, right? And there, I think there's a, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing a little more from you about the element of like sort of modularity or repeated forms in your practice. And um, yeah, if that's, I'm curious if that's led you into thinking in more architectural ways as well, or um, yeah, just to hear a little more about that from you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have such an admiration for um, pattern drafters. Like it is, it is a skill that I am regularly like trying to challenge myself to. Um, and uh, yeah, just I'm continuing to learn about like how to draft a pattern of some kind of complex form. Um, very kind of geometric, um, simple sort of patterns are a really great place to start. <laughs> you know, like it, it is really easy to just make, decide on a scale and make a pattern of squares or triangles or whatever and use that as a starting point so that's what it was for me like i didn't entirely know how to make like a super complicated organic form but i could make something with like a geodesic sphere pattern and then from that place i can like kind of um alter it and, and adjust the shape and and do kind of like uh modify it in certain ways um so uh yeah that's that sort of very geometric um uh form of, of making patterns is, is how i really started um and then kind of expanding into more complicated things over time um the modularity components of of my work um i don't know i'm thinking just so much about like um where things go after they're made um, and having things exist in a very modular way um, means that they can that they can break down really easily, easily, and they can be stored easily, and they can ship um, easily. And um, something I've kind of encountered in grad school is that a lot of a lot of the faculty in my grad program um, find that to be a very uh, unsatisfying parameter to set for yourself. Um, but you know what, I, I completely push against that. Like, I think that um, there are very real concerns about, um, about storage of objects in an in a increasingly mass consumerist society. And um, it's not, it's, I, for me, like the sense of modularity is not just a practical kind of background thing. It's just as much in the forefront of the work, knowing that the work can can break down um, and can be um, mutable, can can be stacked or arranged in a different way. It's not, in, in that respect, I see it as, as a very kind of queer gesture of like resisting the one thing that this object, like this object has to exist in one way. Um, being modular means being playful, means taking on different forms. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I love that you're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry that like that is <laughs> not appreciated everywhere, but I think it's great. Um, I want to respect your time, Max. I, maybe we'll just finish out with this one last question, um, and I might just expand on it because I know you did talk about a couple artists that um, that really sort of you feel like gave you some blueprints for what you do. But is there like that question? But plus, like, are, is there anything that you're looking at right now that is really exciting to you or inspiring to you? Um, that we can kind of close out with, so. Um, oh man, um, it's, it's definitely not a, a one person kind of thing. I think that for me um, in undergrad and leaving undergrad, um, it's really kind of developing uh, um, a whole kind of cast of characters that I'm interested in. Um, like I love drag queens and I follow a lot of drag queens and get so much in, inspiration from the, the work that they do. Um, but I'm not really into this like super highly individualized, like exceptional capitalist kind of mindset that's being kind of adopted by drag culture. Um, so drag queens kind of satisfy one component of inspiration for the future for me. Whereas um, uh, 
other artists can satisfy something else, even if I, I'm not like as visually interested in their work. Um, just someone who is like, um, I don't know, I'm kind of struggling to come up with names or, or whatever, but um, there are, are lots of artists I've met over the years who are just like, just really nice and, and really um, welcoming people who want to be a part of a community. And even if their work isn't the most exciting, like I still really um, value their, their work as artists and, and model myself after examples of artists who, who are just very compassionate and engaged with their communities. So um, it, it kind of goes, I, I feel a little bit like a broken record, but it, it goes back to um, the idea of constantly looking and constantly being receptive and kind of picking and choosing different things that make sense um, for, uh, for yourself. Um, so I, I, I mean, I did not ever look at one person and, and see like, um, this person did this residency, then they did this residency, then they went to grad school, then they did this exhibition. Um, but, um, yeah, I just regularly, um, looked at and continue to look at lots of, um, different folks. As for, um, what I'm looking at now, um, that's, that's kind of carrying me into the future. Um, I don't know why, but that feels like a really hard question. <laughs> um, I think that um, I am just so, uh, I feel like kind of out of breath, like coming out of grad school. And I'm, I'm so in the mindset of like, just, I just wanna hunker down for a month and like rest and kind of reassess my studio situation before moving forward. Um, before, yeah, before um, assessing what the future looks like. But I mean, I'm so invested in um, uh, artists and arts organizers who are really interrogating like the, the really kind of existential problems within the art world. Um, I really recommend everybody to read the book White Walling by Aruna D'Souza to talk about like um, racial inequity and racial injustice within the art world. So all of any and all efforts to interrogate and and um, interrogate the problems within the art world um, and to advocate for uh, an art world that is not purporting white supremacist ideals and, and making space for everyone. Um, I'm, I'm just so invested in, in that. So, so um, I say that that is like a, a kind of general kind of motivation for the future. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. No, and I, I really like that because I feel like it's important to acknowledge that some, like I think we oftentimes get into this mindset of like, who are artists that inspire you or like having to always look towards that space to think about like what is informing our thinking behind our work. Um, but this idea of like, what are other things that are, I mean, because our art's always engaging, right, with like the, the world. And so it's like that, that, that those kinds of places and these, like the reading that you're talking about and sort of doing that kind of restorative work of just being in that space of like rest and whatnot, um, that those are all important aspects of practice as well. So yeah, totally. I think you're absolutely right that it, it, it really doesn't need to be this like we find a map or a model from someone else and then emulate it. I think it, it so much is about just being a sponge and and um, finding things from lots of different people and and talking about it as a community rather than like um, just being a solo individual artist who is like interested in the solo individual art career like having communities with other artists and to just kind of talk about like what do we envision for ourselves as a community of makers and thinkers you know um, and I don't think that necessarily means that we all have to like collaborate and do really big communal kinds of things. But um, I think the more that we connect and talk to each other, uh, the better for our futures. I feel like that is like the perfect spot 
<laughs> to culminate not only this talk, but also just this whole series that we've had um, that has been focused around this um, for this for the past few terms. So thank you so much, Max, for being with us today. Um, this um, conversation and all of the amazing links that Max shared with us will be available on our archive uh, later this week. So check that out um, if you if you would like to um, re-watch re re or revisit any of those links. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now, but we will be uh, keeping the room open for another three or four minutes in case anybody wants to say hi to Max directly. Um, but just Max, thank you so much for being with us today. And um, we just were so thrilled to have you, so. Thank you.